I think it is with my great pleasure to close this conference with a very distinguished closing panel. And I think three of our <coughs> panelists don't need any introduction because we have heard of them before. Um, <coughs> but I want to give you a little bit of the reason. So we have the one we haven't met yet, uh, Frank Paulson, who is the, the president or director of the Law Commission of the Solomon Islands. And he will present the small states on this panel. Then we have Monica, Monica uh, Ferretinta, did I get that right? <laughs> who will actually pre represent law, I think we call it law as a, as a tool of activism. Um, so the lawyers who actually take the cases. Ian, we have, ta Ian, we have talked with uh, Kelman from the UCL. He is our non-lawyer and will represent the science on this panel. And Sir David, we have heard before, will represent the adjudicative part, the judiciary, and maybe also a little bit the arbitration uh, part. Um, we haven't actually discussed who should start, but I think we should start. Frank, would, would you like to start? And what we're going to do is just a very brief snapshot because we are at the end of, a, of two very interesting and full days and then we will give the, uh, the floor the time to also comment if they wish. Frank. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> um, uh, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, the sponsors and the organizers of the workshop especially, uh, in particular, the New Zealand government for making it possible for, for me to uh, be present here. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. I've actually learned a lot. It's been overwhelming uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, um, so coming from a small island state, you know, it's, uh, um, it's, it's a privilege you know, for me to be here uh, to listen to experts uh, on climate change and uh, as well as uh, arbitration. So. Um, I think, thank you so much <clears throat> for <clears throat> um, purposes of my um, uh, uh, presentation this morning, uh, this afternoon, I'll be speaking on, uh, uh, my presentation will be much simpler than the, the, the previous speakers, um, yes, others were highly technical and complex. I will give you uh, just a, a brief presentation on uh, ADR in the Solomon Islands. Um, uh, especially in relation to uh, the traditional governance of ADR and as well as uh, the state governance of ADR. Um, <clears throat> in the Solomon Islands, 90% uh, of the population live in the rural areas. That means that they do not live in urban areas or in towns. So they have been living in uh, community groups and tribal groups for, for a couple of thousands of years. And because of that, uh, they, because they live in communities, they have rules, uh, customary rules, and also as well as um, 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 uh, uh, values and practices. <coughs> no, and those um, those are things that uh, uh, they use um, to um, uh, resolve disputes within the uh, within the communities. Uh, when there is a dispute. Um, what they do is um, the disputing parties, um, they um, get the chiefs. The chiefs are usually um, senior, senior citizens within the community, community who are very respectable um, uh, uh, people within the community. And uh, they usually represent tribes. For example, where I come from, there are four main tribes. And if there's a dispute, all the four chiefs are called and then the, um, the dispute is dealt with. Uh, um, dealt with, uh, and then a decision is made, and usually a compensation is paid. But usually the object of this particular exercise is really to um, um, heal the, the, the um, um, to heal the, um, the wrong that has been created by another one. So it's really aimed at getting people together to reconcile, and then um, to bring back the situation prior to the wrong being committed. So really, this is aimed at um, uh, keeping peace and harmony within the community. Because within the community, um, a community interests uh, override individual interests. So it's about 
keeping the community together uh, and to have a peaceful um, uh, um, community. So, um, so that is how it's done. So basically listening to um, the talks, I mean the speakers over the last couple of days, uh, this the traditional way of dispute resolution in the Solomon Islands um, is consistent with the principles that are being uh, promoted by uh, uh, the need for us to have an ADR or dispute resolution mechanism within uh, our system. Um, on the um, state governance of uh, uh, dispute resolution in the Solomon Islands, like you, we heard from the lady from Fiji yesterday, we do not have a formal uh, ADR system. All disputes end up in court, um, whether it's commercial or any other dispute. That is the way, that is a venue where disputes are settled. And um, uh, we have an ad hoc kind of arrangement in place where uh, court, the high court with its original jurisdiction can direct the parties to go uh, for ADR but I do not know how that is done. We do not have the mechanism in place to do that. And also, um, the, uh, the Constitution allows the courts to make rules for ADR. And as well as, the other one is, the one other thing too that the lawyers use nowadays is the, um, the, they obtain what they call, or we call consent orders, where the parties consent to go and settle outside. If you don't, they come back to court. Um, so basically, um, that is the situation that we have in the Solomon Islands. Um, and currently, because the government now has come to realize that um, there's a need for us to uh, establish a, a dispute mechanism for the country, uh, a project has been, uh, is being implemented currently. Uh, it, it's at its preliminary stages, and that we, will, we hope that we'll be able to um, um, assist disputing parties to take their the disputes to, uh, to um, an ADR um, to, or to an arbitrator or a mediator to ensure that uh, um, uh, to get uh, a mediator to assist them to come, uh, come up with a, with a decision or settlement that, is, that will benefit uh, both disputing parties. Uh, in the Southern Islands, we have we, are short, we have uh, we have shortage of lawyers and shortage of judges, and cases clog up the courts. So that is one reasons why one of the reasons why the government has decided to uh, adopt that. And also, um, the preparatory work towards um, um, getting the country prepared towards um, signing a, and uh, ratifying the. New York Convention is also part of that. So both domestic uh, <coughs> arrangement and the New York Convention thing will be put together and then uh, <coughs> will be implemented. So basically, I think there's a situation in Solomon Islands. Thank you. Yes. Um, these um, two days have been of intense reflection. I think the um, complexity of the issues that we have uh, been uh, addressing uh, it, it has been really very enriching for, from any perspective, certainly for, from the perspective of lawyers. Um, it's quite unusual to have a, a forum where you can, feel, you can hear the perspectives of so many uh, different disciplines and points of views. And I think that um, uh, goes on to um, uh, thank uh, Petra and the organizers for having put together really an amazing program that uh, has given us the gift to reflect in a deep way um, on uh, topics that are of extreme importance. I'd like to just remark two things. Um, number one is that uh, in the context of listening to all the speakers, we have become aware of the um, urgency uh, of uh, action somehow in this area. Now, um, lawyers uh, obviously are to work together with uh, scientists, with diplomats, with politicians, 
uh, and, and with courts in addressing these um, issues. I'd just like to mention, um, perhaps as a, as a key summary of the legal perspective, what we have now is um, perhaps vulnerable uh, sectors in the world, such as indigenous peoples, um, such as small states, such as developing countries taking the lead in bringing very, very challenging cases before courts. And we have heard that we have domestic courts dealing with such um, extremely challenging cases uh, concerning climate change and other environmental issues. Uh, but also, uh, we have heard of uh, new developments in international human rights courts, uh, in international tribunals, both in, um, uh, at, at the general level, such as the ICJ, uh, and also uh, with a, a specific focus on the law of the sea, such as the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Um, and what we are discovering is uh, that we have a number of different forums, formal forums, but also informal forums that can be used for redressing uh, violations that are affecting and threatening the planet and, and, and peoples. So um, what is the task for lawyers? I think we have to be creative and we have to um, work together with um, uh, small states to have an agenda to be able to address the most compelling issues in the next years. Um, I'd like to also remark that litigation, uh, both domestically and internationally, is not the only way. We have heard also of important advancement in arbitration, uh, and uh, particularly of the use of environmental law in the context of arbitration, uh, specifically investment arbitration, which is the growing trend that we have to acknowledge uh, is going to be positive. Finally, um, the, at the substantial level, there has been a, um, an, a new, uh, perhaps, uh, paradigm on, on, on the precautionary principle that is coming really um, to be acknowledged, uh, uh, not just as a, as, a, as a soft law principle, but as a binding rule in different manners. And that was highlighted by the keynote uh, by Lord Carnard. And finally, I, I'll say that uh, th this focus is also <coughs> on two legal consequences rather than just asserting facts in cases. So people want remedies. People want uh, to um, stop uh, ongoing violations and ongoing harm, and that's the challenge. Now, we have also heard from uh, important, uh, well, important points of view from, from, from uh, uh, legal positions as to how to use other fora like diplomacy and politics. Uh, how can we use a general assembly to address certain issues? And somehow there was agreement that um, we don't have just one way. It could be different ways used at the same time. This is all about legal activism, yes, but I think it is needed. Uh, because we cannot uh, wait until a small state sinks. Um, these sovereign issues uh, um, are uh, compelling uh, because their populations are depending from the responses that we uh, produce in that context. So I'd like just to uh, uh, finish with my uh, uh, summary of what I thought were the key uh, legal issues with uh, giving acknowledgement also to the new uh, trend or the new possibilities in litigation that has to do with dia diagonal um, claims, and that is not anymore uh, just at the horizontal level interstate or uh, at the vertical level uh, a state being challenged by its populations in some cases, but also at, at the level of uh, perhaps particularly in the transboundary uh, harm context of uh, populations from one state, say B, uh, suing a state A for um, uh, harms that may be uh, been occurring, originating far away, and that's the context of climate change. I think there is a big future for this type of uh, claims, and uh, I'd like to invite you all to actually get involved in, in, in perspective possibilities of addressing uh, harm in that context. Thanks. We owe so much to our hosts and to the organizers for bringing us here together, but also the fundament of highlighting small states. And small states, not as a homogeneous group who thinks alike, but in their diversity. So some have plenty of resources, like Monaco, Liechtenstein, Andorra, but not all of them have as many resources as those. In terms of resources, 
Of course, they all have rich, diverse, wonderful human resources. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all those small states have the technical expertise which is needed to deal with the issues. Some, of course, you represent them, have what's needed regarding law, and some have universities. Other islands don't have a single lawyer or a single PhD, which might actually be an advantage. But within <laughs> this, what is then the role of science and scientists? What can science offer? I mean, obviously, data, knowledge, information. But far beyond that, for instance, critique. Critique means not just criticisms, but also compliments. Positives and negatives. Advantages and disadvantages. Opportunities and limitations. It goes deeper. Asking the right questions in the right way, not just providing answers. Because often the process of determining what is a question, the process of exploring that, investigating that, can be far more valuable, far more enriching than any particular answer. So this is what we offer as sci from science as scientists. But in <laughs> essence, that's rather similar to law and lawyers, as well as the fact that scientists and lawyers can be equally talented at being obscure and verbose. So in the end, it's fine for me to say, well, this is what I offer. But more important, what do you need? So we need to try and work together to say what is useful to you, what is usable to you, and then we can work with our colleagues to provide the information and data, the critique, and asking the right questions in the right way. And much as I would enjoy that and would enjoy talking to all of you and have enjoyed talking to all of you, we also need to know, well, who is not in the room? Who are we not talking to? The amount of knowledge, wisdom, depth, intensity, and passion which I've experienced over the past two days has been absolutely wonderful. How much is an echo chamber? How much we need, do we need to reach those who wouldn't even consider being here? So let's connect with each other, but connect beyond. And to do that, I offer a haiku. Disputes and small states. In need, in trouble, with strengths. Law and science join. Thank you. I add my tribute, this is, this is on, to Petra, Kathy, the team at Wilma Hale for their preparation and hosting of this outstanding and profoundly important conference of people who think and care and in which it's been such a privilege to take part. An overarching theme has been by what means can disputes be resolved? As Monica has just put it, people want remedies. Not at any cost. The optimum answer would be a multipartite agreement giving effect to Eden's visionary proposal for a new international legal agreement. And I profoundly hope that that will be achieved. I assume, however, for the purposes of these remarks, that like the failure of international decision makers for eight decades to agree on the excellent definition of terrorism proposed to the League of Nations in 1937, that the optimum answer is simply not attainable with any reasonable period. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope that Professor Marc Fontecave in Tuesday's Le Monde is also wrong when he proposes that we do no more than advance little steps over time. We need the little steps, but we need the big steps. Elizabeth, with her, with her unrivaled experience, has asked, for how long should negotiation continue? When does action begin? And there's a leitmotif here. 
as to arbitration, unhappily there is no agreement that could lead to its use. And I therefore examine the difficult and controversial judicial alternative. As I understood Lord Carnworth, having referred to difficulties, he has advised us with all the authority that he has brought into this room that there can be no basic challenge to two fundamental facts, no rational challenge. First, the need to achieve reduction in global warming. And secondly, failure will be catastrophic, and not only for humans. Now, for the reasons already alluded to by more than one speaker, judges must think long and hard before engaging in judicial legislation in matters which might be resolved by politicians. I share that reticence. I'm not going to elaborate these remarks by talking about when judges can and can't uh, properly uh, legislate. The short answer is they can, they must, but after the very greatest thought, care, and if possible, saying no to the proposition. Judge-made international law is prepared to use broad concepts to do justice and acknowledge that upon, and I quote from the ICJ, a foundation of very general precepts of justice and good faith, close quote, exists as in disputes over delimitation of the continental shelf, quote, a rule of law which itself requires the application of equitable principles, and I'm quoting from the North Sea Continental Shelf case in the ICJ reports. I have had a shot at this topic before, following Grotius, Hugo de Groot, and Cicero, and as illustrated by the North Sea case, I have argued that where settled principle is lacking, there should be applied, I quote, the highest standard of practical necessity. Article 38 of the statute of the International Court of Justice only talks about law that's there. It doesn't talk about the law that isn't there. And that's what I'm addressing. In my view, there, the, the test of use of the highest standard of practical necessity that one draws from those two great contributors to the rule of law is met in these circumstances. One, when the, fact, when the facts of the problem and the answer to it are undeniable. Lord Carnworth made clear one needs to be very careful with what one refers to a court, and a court must be careful, as the ICJ is, in exercising discretion whether or not to take a reference on board. It has a discretion to accept or not accept a proposed reference under Article 92 of the UN, 98 of the UN Charter. That was the first. Uh, secondly, it needs to be the case that no political solution is reasonably within contemplation because judges are second-tier legislators. They come in when the real legislators, the policy makers, uh, who are elected or not elected to parliament, uh, either don't do their job or aren't available. And one problem in international law is the absence of a legislature, save to the extent that multilateral treaties and sometimes the Security Council under Chapter 7 uh, are able to fill the gap. The third criterion is a vital one and of immediate topicality, where judicial inaction will result in grave injustice. Judges may not legislate just for the fun of it, and only after considering carefully can I achieve justice or avoid injustice in terms of the first limb of the judicial oath if I sit 
and do nothing. Sometimes that's the judge's duty, to sit and do nothing and leave it to Parliament. And sometimes it's the judge's job to roll his or her sleeve up and do it. The principle uh, I've just discussed, although not its application, is illustrated by the reasoning of the then president of the International Court of Justice, Lord Newberger, uh, in the UK Supreme Court. In Nicklinson in 2014, you'll remember the case. There, he stated that if after 12 years delay by Parliament in determining whether by prohibiting assistance to a loved one to assist that person to travel to Europe to terminate life, the Suicide Act, which made that a grave crime, infringed Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights as to respect for human life. He held that if Parliament took no action, having been alerted to the need for it, the judges should hold there was infringement and intervene and declare that a, a loving husband or wife could accompany their spouse to Europe to terminate life without going to jail for it. Uh, in the event, Parliament did its task of forming a view. It was a different view. Parliament uh, decided there was no infringement by maintaining the Suicide Act. But it illustrates the point. Judges need to be patient, give the legislature a fair chance, but be courageous. The great uh, Dutch judge, Geert, G-E-E-R-T, Corstens, on his retirement as Chief Justice of the Netherlands, chose French to express the judicial responsibility. Prudence et audace. Prudence and courage. And the Victorians in England put it this way, the judge must do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages, meaning in accordance with the laws and usages of the realm, and thirdly, without fear, without fear to act or fear to not act, because uh, some people might dislike one or the other, and with, without fear, without favour, affection or ill will. So a time comes when the judges must act. There are four basic principles. One, it's the obligation of those with sovereign power to protect the citizen. That was said by Sir Edward Cook in 1608 when the crowns of Scotland and England were merged and a Scot wanted to know whether he had the rights of a British subject that Englishmen possessed and the answer was yes. And the great Sir John Salmond in 1901 Law Quarterly Review articulated that proposition. Secondly, the ancillary, as I call it, legislative function of the judiciary, it's a backstop role, to avoid inevitable harm to the community is a facet of the sovereign power to protect the citizen. They're not doing it out of arrogance or usurpation of power, but to protect people. Thirdly, the whole of international law and here I'm getting into deep water because there are more international lawyers uh, here than I find comfortable. Uh, I'm uh, a novice in this area. I've had seven years of involvement of my 50-odd in the law. The whole of international law, not only that identified via Article 38, one of the statute of the ICJ, putting aside the law created by treaties, which I mentioned, but also the law derived from the practical necessity of Cicero and Grotius derives from judges' decisions to recognize its existence as law. Fourthly, importantly and topically, we have the guidance of the new president of the International Court of Justice, President Abdulkavi Yusuf, a name to be reckoned with. He will be a very famous 
name in history. He cited the Roman law precept, hominum causa omni ius constitutum est, all law is created for the benefit of human beings and went on to state this, and he did it in a speech in honor of the great Antonio Cassesi, one of our greatest international jurists, and I quote uh, President Yusuf, happily there are some international lawyers who recognize the ephemeral nature of legal rules. They're not like flypaper, this is my introduction, trapping people in the past, he goes on, they recognize that the rules exist only because and for the benefit of the society that they serve. They recognize that rules evolve, grow, fall into desuetude because of the changing needs of society. Most importantly, they recognize that it's their job to identify, propose, and affect those changes in practice. Does that remind you of what's been going on the last two days? Theory and practice are to a certain extent indissoluble. They're simply two manifestations of our personality as humans. The concern expressed about judicial reticence, which I understand and respect to the extent that it's based on the nuclear case of Marshall Islands and the UK, quite recent case, where the ICJ declined jurisdiction by a majority may, I suggest, warrant another look, given the facts. One, that was talking nuclear. We're not talking nuclear. Second, outstanding, although he is, as an international jurist, my close friend, Judge Greenwood, who was, was responsible for introducing Susan and me to the apartments in which we live in The Hague, He's a very great man. Judge Greenwood voted with the majority in the nuclear case, but he is, has retired from the, the ICJ. And it so happens that his replacement, Judge Salam, another outstanding international jurist, in 2011, as the Lebanese ambassador to this, the United Nations, was a member of the Security Council. And in that role, he supported the proposition that it should intervene in relation to global warming. He's a very, very thoughtful uh, and experienced man, as well as a highly respected international lawyer. And then charmingly, there is the interlude to which I made passing reference involving Judge Crawford. Judge Crawford, another great international judge, was invited to comment at the uh, conference in the, international, in the uh, UK Supreme Court at which Professor Sands QC advanced his argument in 2015 for use of Article 96 by the General Assembly to refer to the ICJ suitable issues of environmental fact and law. And you heard Lord Carnworth speak about that. And if you... Uh, listen to the oral uh, tape presentation which contains Judge Crawford's remarks as well as the typescript which has other people's contribution, you will find that he said words to the effect that if the facts and law justify intervention by the a ICJ, it should accept such a case. And my memory and I don't stipulate it now in case my memory is at fault. My memory is that he broke into Australian when he said that and said something about having the guts to do so. Uh, that uh, is my contribution. I repeat my thanks to the organisers and to all of you.